Hi, so my name is Maya Baim, and I'm a senior here. Um, so you brought up some of the points about the American principles and how the conservatives want to preserve that idea. Um, what is so different between America letting immigrants into our country, one of the reasons why you are here, and helping our own people in our country? People are here because they need help and more opportunities, and that's why you are here, as you called for, for more economic opportunities. Um, so who are we as Americans to say that we will let other people into our country to help them but not help ourselves? Uh, good question. Um, and the way to think about it is like this. If you have a club, you have a set of rules for who gets to be in the club. And you, the members of the club, the Americans who are here now, citizens, get to decide whether to have immigrants, how many to have, and what are the rules that they have to follow. In many other countries, they are very explicit about this. The Canadians will say, we need nurses. We're going to let in 10,000 nurses. The Australians will say, we need radiologists. We need agricultural workers. And we're going to let the people in who are going to benefit the people who live here now. They're very conscious about that. Now, immigrants, I think, have done a lot for this country. They've built this country. They've played a big role in this country. But it's very important to keep in mind a distinction between the legal and the illegal immigrant. Why? Because the club has set rules and there's a long line. It's not easy to become a citizen. It, I came in 1978 as, for the 12th grade. I became a citizen in 1991. So it took me well over a decade and an immigration lawyer and many applications and all kinds of stuff. So it, it's not easy to, and you don't want people who jump the line. Um, and so a lot of times in our immigration debate today, we forget about the distinction between the illegal immigrant and even the term illegal immigrant is wrong because there's no such thing. If you're, if you're an immigrant, you're legal. If you're an illegal, you're not an immigrant. You've obviously not played by the rules. Swimming across the Rio Grande is not considered playing by the rules. So by and large, that's the focus of our debate. America has every right to choose the people it wants it should give priority to American citizens. The country exists for its own citizens. It's a social contract among citizens. So I agree with your priorities. Now the country has decided to take a certain number of legal immigrants every year. I'm in favor of that, but I'm also in favor of enforcing our immigration laws. My wife Debbie, who's here in the audience, Debbie's an immigrant from Venezuela. I'm an immigrant from India. So we obviously both are immigrants. We like immigrants, we like immigration but we don't like illegal immigration. And this is where the media is being very sly. I mean, I read the New York Times. Immigrants living in terror in Trump's America. I'm like, I'm not living in terror. Why not? Because no one's trying to deport me. Why not? Because I'm a US citizen. Because I came by the rules. So it's important, but we're a nation of laws. Let's enforce them. Um, but even then for like, not the not talking about the illegal immigrants, but the people that are legally allowed to come over here. Why are we focused on letting them in and helping them? I'm all for immigration, but you brought up the point of what's mine is mine and I shouldn't have to share it with other people. Why are we opening spaces to other people to come in and have economic success whenever we're not even willing to help out the people that have been born in America and have legally been citizens since the beginning of their generations? Yeah, because we'll remember that they too came, if they didn't come as immigrants themselves, many times they're descended from immigrants. So the immigrant pattern goes way back. Now in the old America where there was an infinity of land, you could come in the 1850s and there was no question. You could just go out, go out as a homesteader and there was land available for you. We don't have that now, right? So we've got, I think we should have an immigration policy that asks how, how do these immigrants help us? Now if an immigrant is coming as an entrepreneur, they're gonna start businesses, invest money, create jobs. That's good for natives. That's good for people here now, right? Uh, if, if, someone is, if someone comes as an agricultural worker in California, that's a tougher one because there are people who are, gonna, who are willing to do agricultural work, but the immigrants will do it for less. That's a tougher question. And in the past, we used to have a guest worker program called the Bracero program, where Mexicans could come to America, work in the agricultural fields, no US citizenship. Work, get paid, pay taxes, go home. So there are all kinds of in-between policies to consider. And um, 
it looks to me that our country is overdue for an immigration debate to sort out these very issues. All right, thank you. Okay. Eller, I had a quick question. Do you, you looked at Obama's presidency and Trump's. Do you sometimes feel that over the past few years or ever since you've been in America, do you feel like sometimes America gets involved in other countries' situations and issues that they're having? And how do you feel like we should handle them, whether we should be involved or not? Very good question. This is about how involved should America be in sorting out the problems of other countries? Um, and the answer is that, unlike the Europeans, who have actually had a very long involvement in and familiarity, familiarity with, the British, for example, came to India, I believe, in the 17th century. So they, have, they had been in India for 200 years, and they've left a very strong imprint. In fact, the reason I'm speaking to you in English right now, when I first came to America, you know, I'd go around, people would go, you speak unbelievable English. And I go, well, I've already been in the country for four weeks. They'd be like, what? But obviously I learned as a kid, uh, but they didn't know that. They just thought it was unbelievable that I spoke really good English um, in America. But the reason I speak English at all is because of British influence in India. Now, coming to your question, America, because we're such a big continent and we're a little isolated from Europe and from Asia, by and large, our knowledge of these other cultures is quite low. And so we always have to be very careful in getting involved in other countries because we don't actually know what's going on in the ground. You know, it's a, it's a commonsensical principle. If you, let's say you show up in a, in a mall, you see an SUV, the door is open, there's a three-year-old kid in a car seat, and there's no mom to be found. What do you do? You say, there is a negligent mother who has left her kid, I'm calling 911, I'm calling Child Protective Services, what do you do? Because you could be wrong. It could be that her other kid is having trouble and she just ran in to help him. He's in Starbucks and she has to grab him. And, and so the kid is not being neglected. You just don't know what's going on yourself. And so what do you do? You should be a little cautious. You should try to learn more. So the bottom line of America is we have lots of problems at home. I think Trump's idea that we should focus on American problems is good. Now, there are bad guys in the world who want to kill us. And that is the sad fact of the matter. And so recognizing that and not just saying, okay, well, you know what? We'll wait around here when they show up to kill us. We'll then kind of do some things. It's good for us to have a foreign policy that is aware of dangers to American security. That's one of the main jobs of a government. Then one of the main jobs of the government, in fact, the main one, is to protect us from foreign and domestic thugs. The government, that's the first thing any government should do. And in fact, it should do nothing else if it can't do that. Everything else it does is secondary. So protecting us from foreign threats, that's a very legitimate job of the government. But in terms of trying to fix other countries' problems, uh, I think we've got enough here to worry about right now. Okay, let's take maybe one more question. All right. And I would like to then wrap it up. Or actually, there are two. I'll finish with both of you, and then I'll close out, okay? All right, where's the mic? Oh, the, oh, okay, sorry, go ahead. Hello there, sir, how you doing? I guess pretty good. Uh, good. <laughs> I thought it was one of those, you know, questions that didn't need an answer. No, no oh, that wasn't my question, don't worry. I'm just being cordial, I guess. I, I wrote down my question so I wouldn't forget. Uh, I and many others are con continuing our education online with Ben Shapiro, Andrew Clavin, Stephen Crowder, Prager University, etc., many others. And um, in, honest, in all honesty, I came upon uh, those great political thinkers because of Milo Yiannopoulos. I saw him and the bombs that he was lobbing, and then I was like, well, I like what the people he's making angry, but it's, uh, I, I can't you know, ride gung-ho with him. And then I came across the others, and I was like, these are the people I like to listen to. But in the pursuit of political knowledge, am I selling myself short? Should I be... Uh, looking at some other places, or are those uh, political thinkers enough uh, to you know, counteract the narrative that we hear and then also um, help with other generations? Well, in the political arena, that's a pretty good start. Those are, those are smart guys. I would add Charles Krauthammer. There are other names I could, I could add to the list. But also remember that, in, in, that the greatest thought in any society 
is in general going to come from dead people. This may seem weird to say, but in general, the past has existed much longer than the present. The people who are walking around now are a tiny minority of the people who have, who have lived. And through the past, wisdom has been distilled through the centuries, right? So you take somebody like John Locke. John Locke was actually one of the smartest men of the 18th century, worldwide, right? Andrew Clavin may, may be one of the smartest guys in Beverly Hills, California, but I wouldn't say he's one of the smartest guys in the 21st century. So what I'm getting at is by, by reading the classics, the great thinkers of the past, you become wiser than experience can ordinarily make you. You always think, well, experience is the best teacher. No, experience is very limited. It just happens to be all the bumbling fools that you run into every day. Your experience is limited to them. But if you go to books and ideas, you get experience in other times and other places. So you can think of the past as a form of travel. You're traveling through time in the same way that you'd learn a lot if you jumped on a plane and went to Cambodia. You'd learn a lot from a different place. Well, we can learn a lot from a different time and place. So don't give up on the great books. Okay? Yes, yeah, someone down here. Uh, yeah, let's ask this young lady right here. Go ahead. Okay, so I'm, name, I'm Savannah, and I was wondering, do you agree with like welfare and food stamps and stuff like that? The question is, do I agree? Like that America should have that. Yeah, do I agree with welfare and food stamps and other such stuff? Now, that's a little bit of a complicated question because, because let, let, me, let me look at it this way. The number of people who are on food stamps in the United States, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but the number escalated dramatically in Obama's America. In other words, let's just say, for example, and I'm making up these numbers, that there were 30 million people on food stamps, or 40 million people on food stamps, suddenly, in eight years, 70 million people are getting food stamps. Yep. This is because Democrats like to expand the reach of food stamps. Now, the important thing to realize is for Democrats, it's considered free stuff. Because you get a card, you can go to the grocery store, and you can get stuff without paying for it or by paying with the food stamps, with the EBT card. The question I would have is this. Did the number of hungry people in America increase from 40 million to 70 million in eight years? Was the Obama economy so terrible? Did he do such a horrible job that essentially he flung 30 million people into poverty who now need to be fed at someone else's expense? Remember, Nothing, Milton Friedman, the economist, once said, there's no such thing as a free lunch. By which he meant that nothing's free. People say, well, education's free. Education's not free. It costs money to have this building. It costs money to use this technology. It costs money to have books. Somebody's paying for it. Somebody's paying for it. So is it fair? It looks to me, am I in favor of food stamps? Yes. Am I in favor of unemployment benefits? Yes. But. I would, I would confine those things to what FDR himself called the truly needy, or one scholar, William Julius Wilson, calls it the truly disadvantaged. We have to be careful to make sure that the guy that we're given the free stuff to, A, really deserves it, and B, is also going to work to get himself or herself off the free stuff. We need to set up ways, because whenever you, you, you do things that are supposedly good for free, you create bad incentives. Let me give you one example. Uh, this relates to Obamacare. Isn't healthcare right? Because after all, people get sick. Shouldn't they? Should we be able to give them healthcare? Well, let me ask you this: Isn't food a right? Shouldn't people have a right to food? Now, let's imagine that the U.S. government were to say to you, "Okay, you have a right to food. So when you go to Kroger, you just fill up your cart with what you think you need for the week's groceries. But when you show up at the counter," You don't have to pay. You just take the stuff and go. What would happen? What would actually happen in this country if you did that? Well, you'd say, first of all, normally I buy two cartons of milk, but it's free. I'll buy 10. <laughs> so you fill up your cart. Your cart is huge. You show up at the counter. Now, the person at the counter doesn't really care, but somebody owns that store. The guy who owns Kroger, John Kroger. 
I'm just guessing it's him. He goes, hey, I notice people have taken all this stuff. But an even more important realization, none of them are really paying. This is great because since some other guy is paying, I will now start charging $40 for a carton of milk. Why? Because the guy's not going to care. It's free to him. He's not paying. So suddenly milk now costs $40. And who's paying? The taxpayer. The third guy who's not at Kroger, who gets no milk. That's the guy footing the bill. And who's ripping him off? Two people are ripping him off, Kroger and the customer. Because the customer is taking more milk than he or she needs, and Kroger's making a profit that's undeserved because some third guy is being cheated. So what I'm getting at is that politics can be a form of cheating. Politics can be a form of two guys getting together to rip off some third guy. And part of being smart is figuring that out. Not just being an idiot and going, oh, I like free stuff. Realizing nothing's free. Someone's paying. Who's paying? Is it fair that they should pay? This is part of our democratic debate. And I'm not trying to resolve it again. I'm just trying to teach you how to think about it and to look behind the curtain, like in The Wizard of Oz. Let's look behind the curtain to see what's really going on. Okay, I think we're out of time, guys. I want to say thank you for this invitation. Thank you for coming. I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you.